welcome back. It's the World Soccer Talk podcast, the only podcast that focuses on watching soccer on TV, online and apps. Coming up on this week's show, our thoughts on the FA Cup third round viewing experience. Another presenter leaves B in sports. How Fubo's changes will impact soccer fans. Sling makes it more difficult for fans to watch La Liga. Plus, we have letters from you, the listeners, in our mailbag section. My name is Christopher Harris, a.k.a. The Gaffer, and I'm joined today by my co-host, as always, Kartik Krishnaya. Kartik, um, I really enjoyed having John Nicholson on last week. I, I disagreed with most of the things he said, um, but I, I didn't want it to be a debate show, like back and forth, because of the, it could have dragged on for like an hour at least. There were so many good topics, but I did appreciate his, uh, his input and his feedback, and uh, I think you did too. Yeah, I, I enjoyed having him on. I think he ha- he has a very kind of uh, intellectual way of looking at things, also maybe a romantic way, and those are um, important perspectives. I think, particularly for American fans who are, who may be newer to the game or don't understand necessarily the culture around local football and local clubs, and how that. Um, how, how that relates to supporters and how uh, mm-hmm. uh, that relates to supporters' experiences. I mean, I think, though, the thing that always has to be stated and reminded uh, people need to be reminded about is that the Premier League is a television-based league. I think attendances and grounds are immaterial for the, for the large uh, to the to a large extent. So, um, yeah, it was an interesting discussion. It was great to have him on, and, and hope to do it again soon. Yeah, and that's the thing, too, with the Premier League, too. I mean, it, it is one of those leagues, or actually English football, top-flight football. There's uh, before television. Well, actually, not even before television, but before before Sky Sports and, and, and uh, Sky Sports and thereafter. And, and the differences between the two are quite stark in terms of the amount of coverage, but not just the amount of coverage, but just the the globalization. And, and you and I and, and many others have been watching, I mean, English football since like you mean the eighties and the nineties. I mean long before Sky Sports and long before the Premier League. But those who are new to English football or, or European football in general, uh, having watched it in the last decade and and that's kind of their experience. That's so different than somebody like John, who I, I admire, or respect. Uh, he's been on this podcast many years ago, many times. He used to write write a, a weekly column for World Soccer Talk. I really uh, admire his his thinking, but it, it's in many ways it is old fashioned in terms of uh, kind of and it's it's that local community aspect of of somebody living in the area supporting his or her local club, and uh, versus I mean people on the other side of the Atlantic, um, not just us, but but I mean all all around the globe watching the game and feeling that we're part of a club when we might be completely removed from that, geographically at least. All right, Kartik, so speaking of uh, globalization, um, being removed from clubs uh, and, and, and watching soccer from around the world, I mean, this past week I've probably watched more soccer than I've done in, in a few months uh, on a weekly basis. And I have to say, though, Kartik, there wasn't a lot of good football, to me at least. The, the one match I, I, I thought was... Uh, Above the rest that I really enjoyed was uh, Arsenal against Leeds United, uh, the Monday FA Cup match. And this one was an incredible first half performance by Leeds United and an incredible second half performance by Arsenal. Um, What about you? What what was your favorite uh, moment uh, from this past week? Uh, I was probably Cruz scoring uh, Olympico today. Or in in the Spanish Supercopa, uh, from uh, I, I, in terms of an individual moment, I guess my favorite match was probably Watford Tranmere. Uh, I had a, a, a hunch that this might be competitive. Watford has played really well in the Premier League lately since Nigel Pearson took over. A lot of squad rotation for him, uh, but they got a three. They took a three 0 lead against Tranmere, which is a, a, obviously a Merseyside club, uh, the third club on Merseyside. I think we've talked about before on this podcast how close they've been, uh, how close they were several times in the 1990s to making it uh, a trio. 
uh, of Merseyside clubs in the Premier League, and uh, they're in League One these days. But they they fought back and and uh, equalized three three, uh, so that was enjoyable. I have to say, Chris, though, honestly, the reason there was so much bad football this weekend is because of the fixture congestion in England. Too many matches over the festive period. Too many injuries. We're seeing teams uh, now. We're, I, there, I, I, I know this has always been a, a problem. The number of matches over this period uh, of of uh, the the holidays in in English football um, and in. To, to a lesser extent in Scottish football, I've never seen the number of high-profile injuries and injuries that I think uh, are going to uh, reshape the relegation fight and the fight for the top four uh, in the Premier League uh, as we have this season. And also, just one quick note, and I know you you, you saw this with with your own club, Swansea, clubs that are uh, pushing for promotion uh, from the championship uh including leads to a certain extent, but especially Swansea, Nottingham Forest, and some others, uh, decided that they weren't even going to play B teams. In some cases, they played essentially C teams uh, and got themselves out of the cup so that they weren't creating more fixtures and potential replays and more trouble as they pursue uh, promotion from the championship. So I think this FA Cup third round weekend really has to be um, rethought in terms of when it falls on the calendar. Well, there's a lot of topics right there to, to chew on, Kartik. I, I mean, to me, it's one of those things that there's, there's always been fixture congestion. I, I don't think that's the, the reason why some of these games were, or well, most of the games were boring or uneventful. I, I think part of it, too, is just the way that the draw happened. I mean, you didn't have a lot of non-league clubs playing at home against a big, a big club. A lot of the non-league clubs yeah. were, were knocked out. And, and then you had some of the... I mean, the, the Watford Tramia game uh, was a game that um, I was listening to some of the commentary on Talk Sport, and I think it was well before half time. They were like, "Okay, this is three nil to Watford. This game is, is is dead and buried. I mean, th- th- there's no chance of Tranmere coming back in this one." And of course, they did. I mean, famous last words from that from that reporter. But but I, I, to me, injuries. I mean, I would have to see some evidence of this. But to me, injuries happen, especially this time of the season. Uh, in previous years, in previous decades, kind of in this Boxing Day, New Year's Day, um, it, they seem to happen a lot back in the past too. So I, I don't think that this particular last week has been anything different than, yeah, yes, there's been a lot of key injuries to key players that will have impacts, but but th- th- it's had an impact of um, previous decades and previous uh, uh, festive periods. Uh, t- t- to me, it just was, yeah, I agree with you in terms of the quality level. Swansea didn't have a C team, they had a B team, but they were resting a lot of their players because their next match in the league is against Cardiff City, which is the South Wales derby. It's their biggest match of, of the season. And, and to them, if they, if, I think if they were playing, I don't know, like Millwall or Luton Town or something like that, they probably would have played um, some more players, more A players. But, but, but whether it's Swansea or other clubs, I, I guess the part of it too is that with the fixture congestion, which there is congestion... At the end of that fixture congestion, you have the FA Cup. And, and that is kind of like the last chance for a lot of clubs, Premier League, Championship and beyond, to, to rest some of the players before the league play starts. So I think the timing of the FA Cup is unfortunate in terms of just coming when it comes. Um, but, but me personally, I, I mean, in terms of all the matches, um, it, it was a weird experience for me, though, too, because the magic of, of the FA Cup is not knowing which match is going to cause an upset. So going into Saturday thinking, OK, well, there could be some upsets in the cards. And, and they did happen. They did happen. Villa I mean, losing and, and some other matches, too. But even though it's brilliant that ESPN Plus has all of the games live, how do I know if I'm watching the, the right match, the one match that's a must see? And that's why I think radio, in many ways, is still the best way to experience the third round when there's no whip around show, when there's there's no ticker or news kind of uh, a score update in the top right corner. When you're watching a match, you have no idea if that's the best one to, to watch. So the way I watched it was I had ESPN Plus and I think I chose one or two FA Cup games. So I had those on, on my monitors on TV screens. And then I had the and then I muted the audio the audio and then listen to the audio from uh, i think on saturday it was uh, bbc radio 5 live and on sunday it was talk sport and then just listen to the radio commentary because they were going around the grounds across uh, england and wales and anytime any type of upset or any goal happened then i could go ahead and actually change the channel the espn plus and go and go see what was happening and and that to me was the best experience otherwise i would be completely at a loss 
How about you, Kartik? How did you experience uh, the FA Cup uh, third round? On ESPN Plus, uh, I, I think it depended again on on what device I was using. So if I was if I had it on uh, Roku or, or Apple TV, uh, I you're stuck on a game, right? And, and you just have to trust that, that that match is good. And then maybe you're you're, you're fiddling with your phone to try and um, figure out which uh, which game you go to, right? Uh, uh, if you want to change uh, matches, now the the uh, difference with when you watch on your iPad or on your tablet on the ESPN app or your phone is that you see all the scores you see kind of laid out the way uh, MLS live is. And I, and I've done this a lot. I think I've talked about it on the show with MLS live where I've just bounced around uh, from MLS match to MLS match on a Saturday night, uh, depending on the scores and, and what, and what, what seems to be happening in each respective fixture. So um, I did that for the, um, the 10 o'clock or 3 p.m. 3 p. kickoffs, 10, 8, 10 a.m. kickoffs, uh, Eastern Standard Time on Saturday. And uh, it's funny because Watford Tranmere was the, was one of the matches I was focused on anyway. And that ended up being the best one, as I mentioned, or the most exciting one. But, um, yeah, uh, that's how I, I consumed it. Uh, I didn't get to see the Monday match. It was unfortunate. I was in my office Um but uh, that was, you know, if there was one fixture that 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 stood out uh, off the page when the draw was made, it was it was Arsenal and uh, Leeds mm-hmm. uh, other than ever Liverpool Everton. But Liverpool Everton ended up being incredibly predictable as it turns out and, and uh, just furthered uh, the the, the, the uh, crisis, if you want to call it that crisis of confidence at Everton Football Club. But, um, yeah, I I. I I think it depends on how you consume ESPN Plus, and this is something uh, to remember for the fourth round, which is coming up in a couple weekends, that uh, when they're overlapping fixtures, it may be best to use your tablet. When there's one fixture at a at a kickoff time uh, that you want to focus on or just a single fixture at that kickoff time, watch it on your uh, on your television. So, so a pro tip for some listeners for those who have newer versions of Apple Plus, um, Apple TV, <laughs> is that if you do watch ESPN Plus with Apple TV, there's a multicast option, so you can watch ah. four matches at once. So I'm not sure which version you have, Kartik. I have maybe. an older version, and yeah. I've been thinking about upgrading or getting the new version, so that might be incentive to do it in the yeah. next few weeks. Yeah, yeah, definitely, and and that would apply to other games happening too. If there's uh, I mean, MLS games happening or, or whatever games are happening concurrently, you can do it the multicast. Yeah, it, it was um, it was overall a disappointing weekend uh, from the FA Cup. I, I expected more. I was hoping for more. I, I still enjoy the FA Cup. Uh, you, you wrote a piece, Kartik, on, on worldsoccertalk.com that talked about really kind of how a lot of people were tuning out. They, they kind of check out. Yeah. Even if they're soccer fans, they're checking out on FA Cup weekends and then doing what they do on an international break weekend and maybe I mean, catching up some, on some chores or I mean, doing whatever else uh, different than watching soccer. Um, I still enjoy it, but I think a lot of it is tradition. I think it, I, I don't think it's based on, um, you mean entertainment level or excitement level. And um, the one thing though, too, with this one compared to last year, is that um, IMG, who's doing the the world feed, at least pregame, halftime, and post match seem to have more more content. So there was. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't recognize the voices. The voices sounded very familiar. You didn't see their faces, but at, definitely at halftime, you had some of their... Uh, they do a quick roundup of, of the, the scores in the other matches. Uh, they'd give some analysis and talk a little bit about the FA Cup. And then you had some you know, d- different stories or different promos for you know, or, or different archive footage of, of some previous FA Cups. And at least that was better than I think what we experienced, um, I think last year, I think it was, where there was just very little of that. Um, so that that's a positive, but I think in many ways, to me, I think that the ticker or the score in the top right corner, just going through, I think would actually solve a lot of the issues and would make the experience a lot better for uh, for soccer fans. Not not everyone, but at least um, I think for most of us. Now, uh, Kartik, in terms of some of the other matches from this past week, um, it, it, it's really hard for me to. Which, which I maybe I should ask the listeners here, here this one is that with La Liga this season, for whatever reason, I, I just don't seem to be in uh, in it as much as as I have done in previous seasons. I, I watched Friday; it was um, Sevilla against Athletic, and um, the coverage is just so just blasé, just really flatline. 
Um, you had Andres Cordero and George Metellus uh, doing the commentary. And it was very, just, just very blah. I mean, this was a live match. This was, you mean, on... Um, on being sports and being sports in Espanol, it was, you mean, it's, it's a big game. Sevilla is a big team. And just in terms of the commentary, it was blase. And, and I think pretty much as soon as the match ended, that was it. That was the end of the broadcast. And you moved on to whatever the programming, which is probably not live, it's probably some, some other programming. So I was disappointed with that. And overall, too, it just even with El Clasico, El Clasico was such a. I mean, it's just a boring game. I'm just missing a lot of the enthusiasm and excitement that I've had for La Liga in previous seasons, even last season with uh, Real Betis. Um, this season, I've, I've been told that Real Sociedad is a, a, is a club to watch more closely, that they play more of an exciting brand of, of soccer. Um, Mallorca, I'm sure, in terms of even Stu Holden, Carl Martino and uh, Steve Nash would probably rave about uh, Mallorca. But I'm, I'm missing, I don't know, I don't know if it's me, or, or if it's just uh, if La Liga is not as exciting as it has been. So anyway, listeners, if you have any tips on that one, uh, or any recommendations, uh, definitely let me know. And then Kartik, just a couple more things too before we move on to the new seg- segment. Uh, the League Cup on Tuesday, Manchester United against Manchester City. Uh, for listeners on this one, this is a big one for for me. Uh, Peter Drury made his return, yeah. re- return to yeah. the airwaves alongside uh, Stuart Robson. And um, unfortunately, we found the news, found out the news that uh, Peter's uh, mother died over the Christmas break. So um, I can have best wishes to, to Peter in terms of uh, a tough time there and condolences to Peter and his family uh, in regards to that. But it was good, it was good to hear him back on the airwaves. Uh, we've definitely missed him. And it's been a couple of weeks since he's uh, been doing some commentaries. Yeah, very sad news about his mother passing, uh, but classic Pat, Peter Drury uh, commentary that first half uh, he called like no, no no other can. We actually did get to see him a little bit during uh, the period uh, when his mother was ill and unfortunately passed uh, with that uh, NBC uh, Sports uh, download, remember, mm-hmm. uh, Premier League download, which featured him extensively, uh, the Noisy Neighbors, which played on Boxing Day. Uh, but uh, I, I do want to I, I want to uh, point out uh, we talked about Stuart Robson last week on the podcast. Cast and his Premier League commentary is limited to being on the ESPN FC show uh, when he comes to Bristol and he, he was blasting the Premier League and blasting Mike Riley. It was good to have him on commentary for two big matches in three days and on co-commentary. Uh, the Liverpool-Everton match uh, on uh, in the FA Cup on Sunday uh, with Martin Tyler and then with Peter Drury on the League Cup uh, first leg of, of the semifinal on Tuesday. Uh, uh, in order to hear Stuart Robson do cone commentary, you have to watch Bundesliga or Serie A matches or MLS matches. Uh, he's not on co-commentary anymore on Premier League matches, which is a, a bugaboo of mine personally. So mm-hmm. I wanted to point out how good it was to hear his voice uh, and not have to wait for the ESPN FC program to hear his analysis. And one more thing, Kartik, before we, we move on to TV streaming news. And that was I watched uh, Monday's game, Monday's early game, which was uh, AC Milan against Sampdoria. It was the match that uh, marked uh, Zlatan's uh, return to, to the San Siro for AC Milan. And what an awful game this was. This is one of the most boring games I've watched in a long, long time. AC Milan, I mean, I haven't watched them this season, I don't think, but uh, such a bad team. And, and Sampdoria uh, gave it their all, almost won the game. But um, this is a team that desperately needs uh, Zlatan. And of course, Zlatan uh, coming off the Major League Soccer season. I think it needs some time to, to kind of bed in. It's not going to happen instantly. But I watched the game just to see what would happen. And gosh, this was really, really not a good advertisement for Serie A. E- even the commentator, too, I didn't catch his name, but just very just drab, boring, uh, no emotion in his voice. I mean, Zlatan comes onto the, onto the pitch. This is an exciting moment. The, the, the crowd ignites. You mean the, cr- the crowd uh, gets louder. Um, the passion, the excitement, but not carried through uh, through the commentator's voice on this one. So, not a good advertisement for uh, Serie A uh, by any means. Yeah, but before we move on, uh, I want to echo your sentiments about La Liga. Uh, and by the way, I thought that uh, uh, today's uh, Spanish Supercopa, uh, maybe there was some uh, entertainment factor there. The crowd was more seemed to be more into the match in Saudi Arabia than in a lot of yeah. fixtures in La Liga itself, which was quite odd. Uh, but I, I want to echo your sentiments about La Liga. I think what we found, and this is just important for, for television viewing in general. So 
there's always complaints from people who don't like La Liga that Real Madrid and Barcelona are too good and they run away with the league every year, which isn't true, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, Atletico has finished ahead of Real Madrid in the league each of the last two seasons. Uh, at this rate, they won't this season, but they have the previous two seasons. Um, I think what we're seeing, Chris, is Barcelona and Real Madrid coming back to the pack. They're not much better than than the likes of Sevilla right now um, and, and several other clubs. Uh, it means the, the league is lacking a little bit of – it's not an event anymore when Barcelona or Real Madrid drop points. When you see Barcelona perform as poorly as they did against Espanyol the other day, there's nothing really compelling about it, right? Mm-hmm. So it's funny because I, I think people like you and I always would complain and, and would, would give credence to the complaints that, oh, th- those leagues are too predictable. Maybe Juventus is winning too much in Italy, Bayern uh, – Bayern is not doing well this season, but previous seasons they've been winning too much in Germany. Maybe those super clubs do drive interest because when the top clubs, uh, particularly Real Madrid and Barcelona, they have the biggest profiles in the world, come back to the pack in their domestic league. Yeah, it makes the domestic league more competitive. But maybe it makes it less interesting. Maybe the, the matches just aren't as good to watch. I think, I think, yeah, in many ways that's right in terms of, I mean, you need those super clubs. I mean, Liverpool is a perfect example of a super club from the past that, that uh, you could say now is a super club, and especially when they win, if they win the Premier League title this season, which they should. I mean, I think that that officially marks the return to kind of uh, the big time. But, but to me, with La Liga, this is more probably uh, kind of a... I guess, I guess, a, I guess, an answer to or kind of a statement about being sports is just I'm not excited by the coverage. I mean, they don't seem to be excited. They're just kind of going through the motions. And I know there's been a lot of upheaval and changes at being sports, which we'll get to in the news news segment too, in terms of latest change. But I, when I watch La Liga TV, which is available through Being Sports Connect. I get excited. I get more excited about La Liga. You mean in terms of um, mm. the different talent and d- the different uh, segments that they have, and 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 that I've I've watched. I watched quite a bit bit of it this, this past weekend, and I thought this is really good. It's like you mean if you took La Liga TV and then used that, and then actually had the La Liga games uh, shown in between the La Liga TV coverage. I think it'd be a lot better than what Being Sports is doing right now. And and, and again, in terms of. La Liga's contract with being sports, I mean, they renewed it for several years. This is going to go on for a while. So I just don't see what's going to change there in terms of, I mean, DirecTV still doesn't seem to be happening anytime soon. Comcast is pretty much dead in the water in terms of being sports getting added back to that. So what do they do? I mean, do they just carry on kind of aimlessly as they are now? And and I guess that's part of it too, is that, I mean, the Premier League, love it or hate it, at least the... Cons- the coverage is consistently, uh, I'd say, uh, above average. Sometimes it's average. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's below average. But for it's pretty, it's pretty consistent. And you watch that, and it, for the most part, you're entertained, or at least I am. Um, with the La Liga stuff, it's um, with Ambien Sports. I, I'm just not entertained. I'm, I'm just not. It doesn't pull me in. And there's been so many changes too. Speaking of changes, Kartik, let's talk about TV streaming news and uh, uh, another big change at Bean Sports. Yeah, Chris, uh, I guess maybe we saw this one coming. Uh, Just the latest uh, uh, to leave being sports, Jeremy St. Louis has left uh, the Miami-based broadcaster after seven years. He's been there since uh, basically the the, the beginning, Uh, and uh, uh, he's moved to CBS Sports, where hopefully we'll see him involved in their coverage of the UEFA Champions League uh, soon. Uh, In the last few years, uh, being sports has lost four presenters, uh, Kay Murray, Kevin Egan, Terry Lee, and now Jeremy, uh, leaving Gary. Gary Bailey and George Metalis do a lot of the presenting roles for the broadcaster. And uh, obviously they've lost some other talent as well. Uh, people like, uh, people like Matteo Benetti, who, who uh, yeah. uh, could do com- co-commentary. So uh, it's uh, kind of a lean time there at BN. And uh, unfortunately uh, for them, uh, this is a big loss. Uh, Jeremy St. Louis, I was just thinking about this the other day, Chris. Uh, I was thinking about Fox Soccer Report uh, from the days back. Was that what it was called? Yeah, When they started right. in Winnipeg? Yeah. And I was thinking about uh, – uh, Carl, Carlos Machado and, and uh, uh, Michelle Lissell, who, who I got to know when she worked for Toronto FC after that, and uh, and Jeremy and then Terry Lee, and um, did not know that uh, when I was thinking about this, uh, would coincide with uh, Jeremy St. Louis leaving uh, BN, one of my favorite in the business, and uh, hopefully we see a lot of them at CBS. 
Yeah, if there was ever a uh, soccer hall of fame that had commentators and presenters and analysts, I, if for, for North America or the United States especially, I mean, Jeremy definitely would be in there. I mean, he still looks so young. <laughs> He's been around yeah. the Fox uh, Fox Sport Soccer Channel and uh, Fox Soccer Reports, um, and of course, be in sports and, and now CBS Sports. But but like you said too, hopefully, um, uh, hopefully we'll see him on some of the uh, UEFA Champions League coverage. You know, I, I should say one other thing about Jeremy. Uh, when he was at Fox Soccer Report, he was so engaging. It was a time when uh, there weren't that many engaging personalities that were presenting soccer uh, from the UK. And it was great to have one based here in North America, uh, in Canada, that was so engaging and, and I think interjected a lot of humor into, uh, into the broadcast. So uh, looking forward to seeing what he's up to at CBS soon. Absolutely. In the next news item, uh, Fubo TV has dropped Fox's 22 regional sports networks amid amid uh, rising licensing costs. Fubo TV has also dropped FX, FXX, F- FXM, and National Geographic. Although it will continue to offer the FS1 and FS2 channels, Fubo has dropped Fox affiliated television networks in nearly 40 markets. According to Fubo TV, standalone rates for these uh, regional sports networks are not consistent with Fubo TV's mission to provide value and keep costs low to consumers. Um, so, what does this mean for soccer fans um, in North America or the United States? Kartik, in terms of Fox Sports Regional, um, some of those games would be MLS games, some of those games would be Liga, Liga MX games. I know some of the uh, out west, especially. Uh, some of those games would be uh, on the local, uh, you know, Fox Sports Arizona, or Fox Sports uh, New Mexico, th- th- those types of channels there too. Um, but this seems to be really kind of a dispute, a carriage dispute over uh, how much Fox Sports is asking for these regional networks and uh, how much Fubo is willing to pay. Yeah. And then the other thing too, Kartik, and, and I just reported about this um, just recently at worldsoccertalk.com that goes into a lot of detail but Sling TV has made a big change, and it, it's a change that, on the surface, doesn't sound like it's a big deal. Because what they've done is they have the uh, best of Spanish TV package that they've always had, and this is a package that um, had Be in Sports, Be in Sports en Español, uh, access to Be in Sports Connect. Well, just recently, um, Sling TV has removed Be in Sports, the English language channel from this package. So if you previously had Sling Orange or Sling Blue, plus the best of Spanish TV, and you were watching your you know, La Liga or Liga in English language, you can no longer do so through that s- subscription package. So you'd have to change. Now, Sling TV has a bunch of other ones. I think they have a Sports Extra. Um, they also have a Deportes Extra. Um, and those are different packages. I have all the details at worldsoccertalk.com that go into detail. But unfortunately, to me, it's another it's another just pain in the butt. I mean, if you're a fan of La Liga and you're subscribing to Sling TV, you want to watch you mean, the big games, you want, you want to have access to being in sports. Here's another brick wall that you kind of have to circumvent and actually change your viewing habits or change your subscription plan to be able to access being sports. And this is a huge issue um, for soccer fans and especially those soccer fans who've subscribed to Sling TV for quite a few years. I mean, for a long time, this has been a regular being sports would always be available on the best of Spanish TV. Well, now it's only the Spanish uh, channel is available on the uh, best of Spanish TV. And can't take one more news item um, to go through. Benfica has become the first, first Portuguese soccer club to launch an OTT subscription service, which is becoming more and more common uh, in European football. The service named Benfica Play will stream behind-the-scenes content and exclusive interviews from the club. Yeah, it's funny, too, because this is becoming kind of crazy. I I think I read this week, too, that the uh, Argentinian Football uh, Federation has also uh, plans to launch or has already launched their own OTT streaming platform with a lot of behind-the-scenes content and interviews, etc., and at this rate, I think, I mean, we, we talked a few weeks ago about Liverpool adding a YouTube channel that was a, you know, you have to pay, you have to subscribe to actually watch it. At this point, it seems like any club, any major club or any major soccer federation or confederation is just like going fast to try to get their own OTT channel. 
and uh, add more content to it and then hope that uh, they can monetize it through I mean, whether sponsorships or advertising. But um, I'm sure this will be one of uh, many to come in, in the near future. The uh, TV ratings, we have the latest numbers at worldsoccertalk.com, so you can check those there. Uh, the FA Cup ones, we won't know because it's on ESPN+, Plus, and that's kind of a, a black box, so we don't know what those numbers are. But in recent weeks, we have posted some of the TV ratings for everything from La Liga to uh, Ligue 1 and the Turkish Super League. So if you're curious to see how many viewers BN Sports is getting for those, those games, if you're curious to know how many uh, viewers... Um, uh, watching PSG games in North America, well, in the United States, check out worldsoccertalk.com on, on the homepage. You'll see a lot of those numbers there too under our uh, TV ratings section. And, and you might be surprised by, by the PSG numbers especially. All right, Kartik, let's move on to the list of mailbag. Uh, the first one is from, it's actually from Twitter. It was Derek Ray posted a comment about uh, John Nicholson's interview. And he said, often in the USA, we understandably think that more soccer games on television, the better. Undeniably true if you're a viewer in far away Missouri or Nebraska. But there's another side to the argument, and that's aired articulately uh, in the interview with John Nicholson. Next up is Tim Keen. Tim says, just listen to the podcast with John Nicholson. I think a better title for his book would be A Bitter Aging Socialist Guide to Football. <laughs> it would seem he wants to return to the age of grounds that resemble public toilets and pitches that have just had the cows driven off. I'm sure he relishes a warm paper cup of a liquid marketed as tea and a pie left over from soldiers rations in the trenches of World War One. And let me interject. I mean, Tim's kind of been a little bit um, sarcastic, but actually this is not too far from the truth of how what the experience was like in you know, in the 70s and 80s uh, going to uh, soccer grounds in Great Britain. I, I experienced it. I mean, um, the public toilets especially. I think we talked about this in a few previous episode too, that David Dean, that was one of his big things before um, the Premier League became founded, was when he, when he came to the United States and went to a lot of the Miami Dolphin Dolphins games, he was just amazed at the public toilets in terms of the cleanliness, in terms of the number of them and all of that. So when he went back to London and back to the UK, that was one of his major things. He said, we have to change English football and starting ba starting with the toilets. So we need to kind of update these stadiums, make them more modern, make them more of a family-friendly atmosphere instead of a concrete wall that's been used for a toilet. And uh yeah, I can attest to that too. It, it was pretty bad. Let me go on uh, as far as Tim's comment. Tim uh, continues say, saying, um, while I agree that prices are not inexpensive, but that's what happens when you attract many of the best players in the world. But before we blast the clubs for restricting access, access, let's remember that the growth in television lets more people have access. Now the old, disabled, young can watch their teams play. Those who move away from their local teams can still follow the, follow them. I was a, a Watford season ticket holder, and when I left England in 1979, it was almost impossible to follow your team on the other side of the Atlantic. Now I can watch every game live. Yes, VAR in the Premier League has been a disappointment, but it's only been around for a few months, and we'll get sorted out soon. Can we now imagine not having goal line technology, or do you still like a warm cup of Bovril at halftime? Kartik, any, any uh, additional thoughts on that one in terms of some of your experiences with uh, <laughs> public uh, toilets in, in England? Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. That I think the the, the grounds were aging. Uh, they was uh, obviously after um, the Taylor report and after Hillsborough, there was a requirement for all seater, uh, mm -hmm. all, all all seated uh, grounds. Uh, and uh, now we're getting back to a little bit of safe standing. And uh, we've seen safe, safe standing really work well in Germany. But I, I think Germany just has got a very different culture uh, around the sport uh, in terms of uh, – um, uh, what's uh, uh how, how supporters interact with the clubs because they are member based clubs uh, john nicholson did say in the show by the way that there have always been directors and elites that would lob profits off of these clubs that was happening in the 1960s and 1970s like crazy uh at, at, at these clubs uh but i think th th there is certainly um I think there certainly had to be progress, and, and you asked him the question, right, mm -hmm. uh, Chris, during during the show about, well, what would have happened if the Premier League hadn't been formed, would the English First Division have continued as is? 
And he said no. He basically said no in a, in a, in a very roundabout way. I, I agree with that. I think changes had to be made. But did it have to be the Lord Sugar, David Dean, uh, Rupert Murdoch uh, version of things that now has become what it's become, which is a, a playground for oligarchs and people, you know, private jets uh, jetting from uh, Malaysia or from uh, Los Angeles uh, who own these clubs? Yeah, I, I think um, – there is some truth, a lot of truth, that uh, the 1970s and 1980s in particular were a very dark era in English football, and that had to change. Uh, and the accessibility for, for fans across the globe, I think we all embrace that, especially uh, those of us, uh, you, you and I and, those, and, the, and our listeners on this show. However, I think we've gone to an opposite extreme. So I think both are kind of extreme cases, and the happy medium in the middle uh, has just been blown by is the way I view things. One of, the, one of the comments that John made in regards to the research that's in the book that uh, I haven't had a chance to read the book yet, but he did mention on the last podcast is talking about the numbers, the viewing numbers for the Premier League. And that was really interesting to me because that's something that yeah. we specialize in. We talk about a lot in terms of the TV ratings. And he was talking about uh, Premier League matches and how oftentimes, I mean, they talk about kind of the billions of viewers, but oftentimes it's much smaller than that. It could be about 10 million or less. And I was thinking about the Liverpool Man City game back in November. Uh, this week, Sky kind of reported those numbers. So, those numbers in the UK it was approximately about 3.5 million people watched that game in the UK on Sky Sports. Liverpool against Man City. I mean, the two biggest clubs right now in the Premier League for that that title race. I mean, Leicester's in it, yes, but but I mean, the two, the, the two contenders there. And then that game in the United States had I think it was about 1.1 1. 1 to 1. 1.2 million. So those numbers combined, you mean you got what about 4.5, 4.7 million people watched that game, and then that's just the United States and England combined, which would probably be two of the biggest, well, two of the biggest markets, definitely in the top five, to watch that game. Then that doesn't include Asia. You have to think in terms of how big the Premier League is in Singapore, uh, in in Malaysia, in in, in China, you mean in Korea. Uh, then you got Africa which those numbers, who knows what those numbers are, but I'm sure they're huge. Um, and then Australasia. I mean, you go around the world. That I don't know. I, I still think that that number is much greater than what John thinks it is. But the, <laughs> the other part of it, though, too, Kartik, I think a lot of it is that um, how many people are actually watching that game pirated illegally yeah. and are not being counted? And if those numbers were counted, what would that number be? And that, that wouldn't just be for the Premier League. That would be for any any soccer league or any sports league how many people are actually not being counted in those those final tally numbers and that's something that you mean the premier league and sky sports can't say okay they can't say like hey we estimate that there were two i don't know two billion people watching it illegally but um but those are some of the thoughts that came up to uh, came to mind um listening to that interview with john again and, and then also uh, reading tim's comments there yeah, you bring up a good point. Let me just uh, say one thing quickly on that. So uh, that is a great point also considering – and, and I, I'd like to go back and see the research on this. But, of course, uh, the, the gentleman I'm, I'm talking about is very well researched and is very accomplished as a writer, Jonathan Wilson. A couple of months ago, I want to say, on the Guardian uh, Football Weekly podcast, uh, the Max Rushton podcast, mentioned – declining attendances in a number of the country for their domestic leagues and the number of countries you just rattle off uh, because of uh, the popularity of the Premier League. So there's declining attendances for those domestic leagues, according to Wilson, because of the popularity of the Premier League. So there are obviously people who were going to uh, local football matches in, in a number of the countries you mentioned have switched to watching the Premier League. I don't know if that number is factored into John's number. That's a, that's a very... Very good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think in many ways, in some countries, the Premier League or, or whatever league it is, La Liga, Premier League, Bundesliga, benefits attendance at local leagues. So, for example, with Major League Soccer, I think a lot of people, soccer fans are kind of brought in, you mean, Saturday mornings watching La Liga or, or Bundesliga or or the Premier League, and then that night going to watch, I mean, Orlando City or, or you know, Portland Timbers, whoever it may be, and going to kind of that, that in-game experience. Uh, and for those countries where the the times of the local games clash with the Premier League, I mean, we had uh, one listener, I think it was last week's podcast, talking about Norway and how Norway's leagues, um, the, the Norwegian league, 
the most popular league in Norway is the Premier League. I mean, the, the, from TV viewers, people are watching that and, and not as many people are attending the games because the, there's less interest in that. And I'm sure a lot of those kickoff times kind of clash or overlap uh, quite a bit. Yeah, it's a fascinating topic. And, and again, too, if you didn't get a chance to listen to the interview with John Nicholson from last week, I highly encourage the, you to do so. If you're a new listener that uh, tuned in for the first time watching the John Nicholson show or listening to it last week, uh, we encourage you to keep on coming back. And, and this is a, a great opportunity in the listener mailbag where we answer a lot of the questions. We talk a lot about uh, what's happening in terms of the soccer viewing experience. Um, again, whether it's on television or streaming or apps, etc., and um, I mean, just as an aside, Kartik too, I was speaking to an executive at one of the sports broadcasters in the United States, and uh, he was talking about the impact, the influence, that, the impact that illegal streaming is having on rights negotiations in terms of um, a lot of the, the TV companies kind of kind of uh, second uh, thinking hard about whether or not they should actually go ahead and bid for the rights because why should they be bidding for a big rights package um if the if the rights holder if the actual you know whether it's the league or the confederation is not doing anything to stamp out the legal streaming because then that money is lost revenue there's no way that you can say to advertisers okay well we had you mean 2 million people watching a game but we had 6 million people watching it illegally um, they can't, you mean, charge advertisers for those six million that were watching it and seeing the ads. They can only do what what was actually measured. So it has it, ha- it is having an impact in terms of um, broadcasters where they're kind of thinking like, should we go ahead and actually broadcast this league or this competition? Because, you mean, is it worth it? Are we going to get our money back? And um, so those are the types of things to think on an individual level. Uh, I think a lot of people you know, on Reddit and other places kind of they kind of joke about streaming and and even different illegal streams, but it does have an impact, and it um, in many ways could have a, a much graver impact on the future of the sport in this country and and globally, really. Two more uh, questions or uh, feedback from the listeners. Uh, next up is Raymond Dorosco. Raymond says, regarding the Liga MX finals, I was thoroughly impressed with Fox's coverage. I normally don't say that about Fox, but it shows a a demographic shift in American sports culture as a whole due to the fact that you had two minorities in the booth together. And that was uh, Kobe Jones and um, uh, Marquez uh, Garcia, Adrian, I believe it was. I think think that's a watershed moment, uh, Raymond says, uh, not just for America. For Mexican soccer, being on American English television, but for American television as a whole. And that's a good point. I didn't think of it that way. Um, but yeah, definitely a good point there from Raymond. Last but not least, Corey says, NBC has increased prices and walled off more and more Premier League games in each of the last few years. It, it also made it harder for other sports websites to use Premier League highlights on demand. What are the odds that it is losing money on its current Premier League deal and the company is looking to turn a profit? We already know that NBC and CBS were losing money on the Thursday night NFL deal that recently ended. Just curious if you think that that would be a factor in a renewal at the end of the current rights agreement when there's sure to be a price increase for Comcast to keep the league. Great question, uh, Corey. And that's the thing, too. You get two sides to the story. So I've spoken to people executives basically sources at nbc sports and um they've mentioned to me that um that with the premier league that they're not making money that that it, it, it's it's very difficult to i mean they, yes, they do a lot of advertising on the sponsorships and things like that but the amount of money that they're paying with the rights fees which was close to a billion dollars for the six-year deal uh it's extremely difficult to be able to recoup that money and and plus all of the production costs in putting that together, uh, going to England, going to these fan fests and, and the talent that they need and, and all the, the people that, that's involved. It's very, very difficult to, to be able to break even on that. Now, that's NBC side of the story. I've spoken to other executives, at other broadcasters. They've said that that's that's um, boulder dash. You mean that you mean that that's that's not true, that NBC Sports is doing a, you mean, a great job of monetizing the Premier League and that uh, don't listen to what uh, NBC is doing. So part of that, though, too, is because of the when it comes up for rights renewal time or the rights bidding time, 
is that uh, you will hear different things from different people depending on which side of the fence they're on. I um, mean, those that say that it's difficult to make money on with the Premier League, maybe that enters the equation with the Premier League thinking, OK, well, maybe we shouldn't uh, shoot for the moon with, with uh, the amount of money that we're expecting. Maybe we should kind of uh, be more reasonable and, and lower that a little bit. So um, with, without seeing the financials, without seeing the numbers, um, it is difficult to be able to say for sure there to Corey uh, to answer that question. But um, I think it's a factor. I mean, the amount of money that they're spending on the rights alone uh, is a factor. And then Corey mentions, too, that uh, he says that we already know that NBC and CBS were losing money on the Thursday night NFL deal that recently ended. And... Um, yeah, we and again too. A lot of it depends on the competition. A lot of it depends on who else will, will be bidding for the Premier League uh, rights, and whether that would be a CBS, whether that would be an Amazon, or whether whether that be I don't know a Turner or, or somebody else. Um, that that's the big question, and that's that's the part that will jack up the the the, the, the amount of uh, the actual money in terms of the bidding when you get back and forth with, with uh, the these uh, broadcasters bidding. What do you think, Kartik? Do you think uh, the Premier League is a, a lost leader for NBC Sports, or do you think uh, they're, they're making a, a ton of money? No, I don't know that it's a lost leader. I think they're losing money on it, but I don't think that they're losing as much money on it as on some other packages they may have uh, paid more for. Eventually, though, you, you have to cut your losses. If you don't see the upward trajectory, with which I think the Premier League, they, they, they got a bump the first few years, and it's kind of flatlined, maybe slight growth since then. Uh, you're in a position where you then have to, uh, uh, ha- have to make a decision, especially if it's going to be another long-term deal, if you're going to invest the resources Versus you want in it. Uh, now, it is possible, um, even though they generally don't do this in international markets, Chris, it is possible because of the NBC, uh, Comcast now owning Sky, who is the primary driver of this league to begin with, that they would split the packages and maybe cut some of NBC's losses or offset some of their losses by allowing them either to sublicense uh, some, some content or joint bid which they didn't allow last time, or just split the packages. And, and Amazon Prime uh, uh, Prime Video can can uh, uh, bid on one of the packages like they have uh, in the U.K. and make, make it uh, ex- as accessible as they have in the U.K. So a lot to play out. I mean, I think that they uh, the long-term rights uh, deals that American uh, – networks have signed with U.S. leagues and particularly in college sports have ended up uh, becoming a, a, a lost leader. So I think Disney has lost a lot of money on all the col- on the SEC, uh, ACC, et cetera, at least on, on the front end. They're going deeper in. Obviously, ACC Network has just launched. That's an ESPN property. And now it looks like uh, ESPN will take uh, SEC football away from CBS or ESPN and ABC will. So um, – that also frees up more money for CBS to play with. Um, mm-hmm. And I think the one thing that the Premier League and, and soccer properties in general, outside of uh, the FIFA contract, outside of the World Cup uh, deals uh, with uh, Telemundo and, and Fox have going for them, is that they're still relatively inexpensive compared to American sporting properties. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's going to be interesting. The one that's that's not inexpensive is the Premier League. So uh, we'll see what happens with that. But I think elsewhere you might see CBS especially uh, enter the space in a big way. The other thing, too, about uh, NBC Sports Network and the Premier League is that um, there's a lot of things that, you, that are difficult to measure in terms of what the Premier League offers NBCSN in terms of other things that are not advertising dollars or sponsorship dollars. And, and to me, NBC Sports Network would be invisible, would, would practically not exist if I was not a soccer fan. Because before NBCSN was a channel, it was NBC Sports Network. And before that, it was the outdoor channel. And um, where they used and to have... And in between also. And, and, and versus. But, uh, on, uh, but, but I think with the outdoor channel, it was uh, deer hunting. It was like, it was, uh, they had infomercials for like how to like use a, a like a knife to carve like an animal yeah it was really when they got <laughs> um the but, tour de france that right was strange for them that was uh, so, so that's that's I, I'm, I'm trying to make, uh, kind of follow up on your point i think there is a certain value to 
to the, the, the brand of the channel and, and, and a gateway for other viewers if you have the Premier League. I think that channel's entire outlook changed because they, they, they ended up airing the Tour de France, which brought an entirely different demographic, mm-hmm. I mean, a polar opposite demographic uh, to that that channel. So I, I think the Premier League has opened the door for NBC to be able to air cricket and rugby and any number of other things uh, that uh, and, and really kind of feed off its golf coverage because so many of um, so much of NBC's golf coverage is Ryder Cup, President's Cup, the Open Championship uh, have kind of a British element to them. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Yeah, I, I think actually you're making a good point that you can't just look at the the bottom line from this particular deal and say NBC is probably losing right. money. Maybe they should get out. There's a lot to it. Yeah, yeah. Eight years ago, I would have not uh, watched a minute, single minute of the outdoor channel, and and NBC, I would have said like, yeah, they have. I mean, they have Wimbledon and the, at the time, and they have some golf. Yeah. And and that's yeah. about and the Olympics, of course. But um, in terms of now, eight years later, or seven years later. In terms of having, I mean, the kind of intimate knowledge, not just of, of the network itself and, and the characters and the talent and what they have available, even in, in addition to soccer, but also the amount of minutes and, and time I've spent and many others have spent watching that, that channel. And that's something that the Premier League I mean, and, and NHL and other sports too have bought them and, and offered them um, that otherwise they'd be, they'd be off the map. Last point, you made a great point with Wimbledon. Um, the the blow to NBC, I mean, those of us who grew up in this country of a certain vintage, I think for many years, certain di- – uh, multiple, <laughs> Here we yeah, go. <laughs> uh, Wimbledon was – Breakfast at Wimbledon yeah. was NBC. That was the, the signature property NBC Sports had for a lot of us besides having you know, Major League Baseball, uh, the baseball game of the week when I was a kid. And, and um, they, they had the AFC package in the NFL, which was the, the inferior conference. So um, Bre- Breakfast at Wimbledon was so much a part of – NBC sports branding, mm-hmm. um, even in the days before they had the Olympics. And then once they got the Olympics, I think it was because it was such a big international event. It was part of that ESPN taking Wimbledon away from them um, and taking and essentially monopolizing, running the table in tennis with the exception of uh, the French Open, which is still on NBC. But everything else is on ESPN in that sport in this country. Um, it, it repositioned um, uh, it, NBC in a way where I think uh, – the Premier League, if they lost to Premier League, and presumably if they lost it, they might lose it to Disney and ESPN. Um, I, I think it's the kind of thing that they would guard against for the reason, same reason uh, we're talking about. I think there, so much of their brand mm-hmm. with uh, NBC Sports was connected to Wimbledon specifically, uh, that tournament, even more than the golf that they had. Um I think now the brand of NBCSN, their cable channel, even though obviously they, they have 30 some odd games free to air on, on NBC on broadcast, uh, but so much of NBS, NBCSN's brand is connected uh, to two things, the NHL and um, and the Premier League. So, yeah, I, the more we're talking through this, Chris, I know I'm, we're kind of talking aloud here. I, I think they probably are going to hold on to this thing. Yeah, plus one more thing, too, is that uh – Having all of the coverage is important because even if they, I mean, if the Premier League wants to sublicense some of those deals out to, I mean, some of the packages where they split it up and say, okay, we're going to give 10 games to Amazon and have them show that, it's not in NBC's best interest. I mean, NBC owns the Premier League in the United States. They've really brought it to a whole new level. Uh, they've helped grow it in the States. They've had the Fan Fest. They've had a lot of different activities. They've raised the bar considerably. So uh, to give away a portion of that to you know, Netflix or Amazon or, or CBS or whoever uh, would not be in their best interest. I think that they're all in on this one. Now, with, with the Premier League might have a different story on that or different thoughts. But, uh, but whether you're... A fan of soccer from the vintage years, like Kartik, or from newer years, we want you to have your say. So let us know what feedback you have, what questions you have uh, in regards to watching soccer, uh, any rants or raves, or uh, agree or disagree, or additional thoughts, or La Liga, if you've got some recommendations in terms of some of the clubs to watch, or if I'm missing out on some big games that I should be watching that are really entertaining that uh, you want us to let us know about, or even some, even some great commentators. Let us know. You can always reach us via email through web at worldsoccertalk.com as well as facebook.com slash worldsoccertalk and on Twitter at worldsoccertalk. Plus, of course, you can post your comments on worldsoccertalk.com. 
So thank you for listening. You can get a new episode of the World Soccer Talk podcast every Thursday. Every episode is released on SoundCloud, Spotify, Pandora, YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, TuneIn, Audio Boom, uh, Overcast, and WorldSoccerTalk.com. If you like the show, share it with your friends on social media and give us a review on iTunes. And Kartik, heading into another weekend, we've got the Spanish Supercopa final on Sunday, I believe as well as uh, the return of the Premier League and uh, Ligue 1 is back, as well as Serie A uh, and probably quite a lot more that uh, I'm forgetting about. Actually, uh, Ligue 1 Max returns this weekend after, after the yeah. break. Uh, a lot to look forward to, but uh, what should they do? Enjoy your football. <laughs>